Good morning or good afternoon from where I am in London. Uh, welcome to this developmental webinar. Uh, me, Alan Kelly. Our subject today is Agile Basics. Um, what can I say? Agile Basics. Um, trying to distill Agile down to um, a single short presentation for a webinar is a bit of a challenge. Normally we spend two or three days going over various aspects of Agile on a course. Try and pull it down to just 60 minutes or to allow you some time for questions, 30, 40 minutes. Um, I've looked through it and I've pulled out what I think are five of the most important aspects. Five of the key things which you know, I think teams need to be doing, things that you need to be thinking of. Um, there's a lot more to it some of the stuff we're not going to talk about feeds into these fives and there's a few other principles, few other basics, few other pillars as well we could talk about. Um, and I'm sure those of you who are listening to me will, will probably think, oh, why didn't you talk about one of these other things? Um, really, I, I, I hope we agree on most of the points, but I think it's inevitable that those of you who know a bit about Agile will, will probably come up with five different things, but there's a challenge to you already. If you were going to boil it down to five, what would it be? Um, let's, let's get started. Oh. Um, my name is Alan Kelly. Um, I I think, really, I'm, I'm an author. I happen to like writing. I've written two complete books. Um, and more recently, I've written a, a third book uh, using the, the uh, print-on-demand, lean pub type systems, which makes a very different experience for writing a book. Unfortunately, as, as many of you probably know, writing a book doesn't actually pay the mortgage. So I make a living um, giving training courses in Agile and advising companies on their software development processes uh, and their, their software development products and you know just general consultancy in and around software. Um, but specifically, I focus on Agile aspects and training. That's me. Um, there you go, and there's the first mistake on the slides. Um, I said we'll focus on five basics, and of course, no matter how many times I proofread the slides, it says four right there at the top. Um, it's five. Quality, visualization, iterations, working in the small, small batch sizes if you want to be technical, and vertical teams. Um, so next, I'm going to briefly talk you through each one of these and, and and give you the general idea what I'm getting at here. Of course, I won't be able to give you all the details, but let me try and give you some of the flavour. Quality. Um, you know, as Philip Crosby said way back in 1980, quality is free. Uh, it's been shown in the car industry, it's been shown in the silicon chip manufacturing industry, it's been shown in the rocket industry, and it's shown in the software industry. It's quality, specifically bugs and lack of maintainability that kills us. And quality is not the result of testing. Quality is tied up with testing, yes. And there are some testing approaches which help us build in quality. But fundamentally, we want to build in quality on day one. We are building in quality. What do I mean by quality? Well, the two aspects I, I think are universal to all software are lack of bugs. So bug prevention. Um, there may be other qualities you want, but I have yet to encounter a piece of software which we regard as high quality, which contained a lot of bugs. So to get our quality up, to get some of the benefits of the Agile approaches, bug prevention, techniques for keeping the bugs out of our systems, and when they get in there, getting them out fast. The second universal aspect, I would say, is code maintainability. Code has to be maintainable. You have to be able to live in the code. If for no other reason, you need code to be maintainable so you can remove the bugs that get in there. Um, more optimistically, successful software changes. Successful software, people use it, they want it to change. Successful software continues to sell, it needs to be updated. The world around successful software changes. You know, taxes change, currencies change, legislation changes. Software that isn't used is dead software. Software which isn't used doesn't need to change because nobody uses it and none of these things are important. If you're going to have successful software, 
software is going to advance and live it needs to be maintainable and that includes maintainability to keep the bugs out so when I talk about quality specifically I want you to think about bug prevention code maintainability building the quality I'm not giving you a recipe here to gold plate it I'm not giving you a license to go off and build wonderful fancy designs or cope with every eventuality in future one of the things we want to focus on is is less less design less forward thinking to get higher quality if any of you have come across a guy called Capers Jones, he's done a lot of writing on software metrics over the years. He spent 40 odd years researching the topic and he's one of the few people who really understands software metrics. He is pretty unambiguous on this. And in his 2008 book, he says, the cost of repairing defects is the most expensive single activity in software development. The need to repair defects leads to longer schedules. Longer schedules leads to higher costs. So keeping your defect count down leads to a shorter schedule. Shorter schedules cost less. So better quality software delivered sooner for less money. Defects themselves are expensive. They're very expensive. You write them, they go in there, they need to be found. So it's possibly a test to involve, possibly get further on. They need to be fixed. When they get fixed, they need to be retested, and some fixes have new defects in them. So maybe there's a lot of more work to be done around fixing and testing. They need to be pushed out to customers. Possibly, if your software is going to lots of people, you've got a support desk. Support desks take telephone calls, reporting. Those reports, one bug may be logged multiple times. And the bugs may stop real customers from doing something. So defects are really expensive within our development organization and with our customers. More importantly, defects destroy schedules. Because we, we have these schedules which are supposed to finish on a date and shortly before the end date we start fixing things and then it becomes a discussion not about whether we're going to meet the schedule but how many of these bugs are we going to fix? How, how many bugs can we ship with? How critical are the bugs? bugs destroy schedules. They also draw, destroy predictability because you don't know when you're going to find more bugs. Bugs can appear at any time. Ultimately, defects, lack of schedules, lack of predictability, increasing costs, destroys trust. So in all sorts of ways, a lack of quality damages our whole organization, damages our whole process. We've got to up quality. This means that if we're really going to improve our quality, we need... Oops, sorry everyone there, I pressed the wrong button on my Mac. <laughs> if you're going to improve quality, you need... Oh, sorry, there's a small problem. It should be going to the next slide, but it won't. Okay. Um, we need to invest in quality. We need to invest in the code itself. We need to invest in techniques like test-driven development, also called test-first development, design-driven development, automated unit testing, whatever you want to call it, there's a set of tools, uh, there's a set of techniques. Um, test-driven development's um, bigger brother, acceptance test-driven development, behavior-driven development, they, they're all ways of building quality in very early on. Continuous integration, Build, bring all the code that you're building together often. Run all the tests often and keep doing it. Pair programming. I'm not going to lecture on pair programming. I believe pair programming is highly effective. I believe pair programming makes a net benefit. For those of you who don't know, pair programming is where you have two programmers sitting at one keyboard with one screen working on one task. Um, people are skeptical. Um, I believe from my own experience and from research I've read pair programming is effective. However, I'm not going to spend a lot of my time trying to persuade developers of this simply because most developers don't like the idea and we have other things we need to talk about. We can talk about pair programming on another day. These are all the techniques you need to be thinking of if you're going to build quality in. And you need to be thinking about tools like JUnit, NUnit, Pi unit, all the X unit family of test tools, tools like Fit, Fitness, Slim, um, Gherkin, Cucumber, uh, 
jbehave um, spec flow there are so many good tools out there mostly in the open source free to use domain that can help you with these techniques invest in the quality invest in the code oh sorry for my um okay um invest in technical practices save money okay i've got a reoccurring problem here why my my mouse isn't just clicking to the next slide uh, i expect there's some unusual interaction here with um with um, the webinar software because this was all working early on today i tested it here's our slide <laughs> spend a little money to save a lot of money invest now in technical practices they will save you a lot more money in the long run okay right sorry about the slide problems visualization learn to see what you're doing be able to see the work that is in progress if you can't see the work you can't understand the work you need to see what's happening and when you can see it you can learn from it and when you can learn from it you can change and you can adapt and you can think what you can do to improve so there's many ways you can visualize here's a few get yourself a whiteboard this is one of my favorite whiteboards here the work the team are going to do the work they're doing the work they finished get yourself a whiteboard start using it start tracking your work through see the work move across the boards I know this is the 21st century I know there's a lot of electronic tracking tools out here but I, the power of being able to see the work ideally physically if you need to do it electronically then you need to do it electronically but just see the work you've got just see how it's flowing yeah and there's no reason why you can't start tomorrow I mean that that's, a team has got a proper board proper magnetic board but you can use a non-magnetic board with post-it notes and you can use uh, backs of doors or like this team you can take a, a, a window partition they've laid it up with some magic whiteboard and they've just tacked their cards to it and it's just got them started um, this team went on to get a proper full-size whiteboard and to move the cards over there but you know you can do that tomorrow and then the, I regularly see whiteboards that are started on glass partitions with magic whiteboards get to see the work and, and yes the color coding of the cards here is important the columns are important it all adds the information you can see people call these boards information radiators when you when you can see the work you've got something magical happens because you can all start to understand it um, this team started by just putting up this board and everybody in the team reading out what they were working on write it on a post-it note putting it in the work in progress column and then looking at their to-do lists of the work they intended to do and putting it in the to-do column and then their manager putting in the work he intended to ask them for in the to-do column just being able to see the work you're currently doing and you're about to be doing is very very powerful boards are one of the best known uh, visualization techniques they are far from the on only one here's a burn down chart Burn down charts again are a fantastic way of visualizing what you're working on. They give you an idea over a period of time of what you've got to do, how much work you've got to do, how fast you're going. They're very intuitive and um, most people can understand and read a burn down chart within a few minutes of, of, of seeing one. Um, that said, they're not always the, the the best tool for tracking your work and um, they're, they're more than adequate to get started with in time there are some more advanced tools like a cumulative flow diagram cumulative flow diagram here is very rich in information um, the, the the blue area shows you the amount of work the team need to do and it increases over time some of it gets done but it increases over time which is which is quite common the yellow area there is the amount the team have done and the green area is the amount they've actually pushed out to release. Uh, they're not quite so intuitive cumulative flow diagrams, but once you start to be able to read them, once you once you've built a few and you can read them, they can give you an awful lot of information. There are other ways you can visualize your work as well. Boards and charts are, are, are just a starting point. Um, you know, just just start there. 
do something and, 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 and you will learn some more. The next one this is my, my, my third Agile basic. Iterations. Um, by iterations what we mean is working in short time box periods typically two week periods um, some teams do one week periods some teams do four week periods if I'm being honest I'm really not a fan of three week periods uh, we can talk about that at another time most teams tend to do two week periods you start you plan out the work you're going to do you do as much of it as you can at the end you've got something to show for it Iterations also go by the name of sprints. Um, that word comes from Scrum. Iterations tend to come from extreme programming. Some people call them time boxes. All the same things thing for our purposes tonight. Iterations repeat continually. You don't have a break between iteration. It's one iteration, the next iteration, the next iteration, the next iteration. The only break you get is when you take some vacation. Iterations create a rhythm, they create a regularity, they create a normal, they create places to put your meetings, they put places to have your external meetings, they give you a sense of regularity. You know, we're all used to regularity in our lives, a week, a month, we all got used to school semesters and terms when we were at school. Humans are very good with regular rhythms, iterations give us a rhythm to work for. The other thing they're very good at is they impose regular deadlines. If every two weeks you're, you're stopping and it's one iteration and starting the next, you've got a regular deadline that comes around every two weeks. They also impose a work in limit progress. There's only so much work you can do in a two week period. You can't take on too much work. At the beginning, you, it will be difficult for you to judge how much work you can take on but after a few iterations you'll get a feel for it. In time I'd like to hope that the amount of work you get done will increase but just at a very basic level having a regular two weekly deadline gives you something to work to. It gives you something you limit the work you're going to do in the two weeks. It also means that in two weeks time you're going to be resetting and you're going to be reconsidering again what is the work we're going to do in this next two week period. I like to liken iteration working to um, the metro systems you find in London, New York, Paris and other big cities or the trams you find in a lot of continental Europe. You don't bother checking the times on these things. The trains, the metros, they come around and if you miss one, yeah, it doesn't matter, it's only another couple of minutes to wait and if one pulls in and it's full, it's only another couple of minutes to wait and they keep going. Every few minutes there's a new metro train pulling in. Iterations are like that. Every two weeks a new iteration pulls in. Every two weeks you get a delivery of finished stuff. Every two weeks you get to decide what's the next thing you're going to do. You work to a regular timetable. You work to a regular schedule. In contrast, traditional projects are like those big long distance trains that leave occasionally and are often late. And you're not really sure should I take the train or should I take a plane? Should I take a train or should I drive? You know, you what if Metro systems very regular, very predictable. Iterations give us that regular predictability, they give them a regular rhythm, they give us regular deadlines and they limit what we're going to do. One of the reasons this is important is that humans are very bad at estimating time. Um, if I had more time I could talk, talk you through this but you know, humans are very bad. You can put them in a, a, a lab rat environment and you can test them and we're really bad at estimating how long something will take. We are however very good at working to deadlines. We're motivated by them, we've been working on time, we can start change our work around. What this means is if we're working in iterations, get good at fitting the work to the time. Every two weeks there's another iteration coming along. Get good at fitting your work into two week periods. You won't be able to do it on day one, but that's why we practice every two weeks. Every two weeks another iteration, another reset. And because the iterations are very re regular and rhythmic, we get a, something to benchmark ourselves against. We know what we did last time, we can benchmark what we think we can do next time against that. We work to the deadline. There's always another deadline coming along. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. That's what it looks like. 
usually we run them midweek to midweek. You start with a planning meeting. As its name suggests, a planning meeting, you talk about what you're going to do during the next two week period. That means the prioritization of all the work you could do, you get a prioritization. This is usually done by a business representative. The work is prioritized. You will probably break the work down. There's various ways you can break the work down. There's different techniques, different teams use, but you look at all the work's been asked for and you break it down try and get it into small manageable chunks that will fit within two weeks. Once you've done that, you come to some agreement. Development team, business size, people setting the priorities, the people doing the work, you come to an agreement about the amount of work that has been asked for that you think you can do in the next two week period. If you think you can do more, then yes, you take some more. If you think it's too much, well, we either push it back or we expectation manage it. How you actually do the agreements varies from team to team. There's different protocols and depends how strict you're being around some of the agile methods. However you do it, you come to an agreement over what you think you can achieve in two weeks. Once you've done that, well, you get on and do the work. Um, and it'd be nice to say you don't need any other meetings, but you probably do very least you have the daily stand-up meetings every day usually first thing in the morning you get together for a few minutes with your teammates you talk about what you've done what you've achieved what you're going to be working on today any blocks or impediments even quite large teams can do a stand-up meeting in 10 or 15 minutes you should be keeping them under 15 minutes and i've seen a team of 28 people do them in 15 minutes requires a bit of practice and a, a, a few a few standard rules, a few ways of working if you like, you can do them. Decide the work you're doing at the beginning of the iteration. Every day you do a stand-up meeting, you get to the end of the iteration. Now, 10 years ago, it would be quite normal for a team to do a demo at this point. 10 years ago, that was kind of, um, if not state of the art, then definitely one of the better teams. Increasingly now, Teams may demo or they may not demo, but they release. At the end of the two week period, they push to a release and they push it out to real customers, real users on a live system. The best teams today are releasing all the way through this two week period. You may have planned out the work on the Thursday for the next two weeks, but as soon as it's ready, you release it, you push it to live. I know that's a big ask for, for many teams. We'll come back to that in a moment, but th this is a key point. All the way through here, you might be releasing or you may just release it at the end. What you want at the end here is you want it to be releasable. Once you've done your demo or you've done your release, the iteration ends, you review, you do a thing called a retrospective. You talk about how you're working. You talk about how things could be better. At the end of the retrospective, well, I usually go straight into a planning meeting. Maybe you take a break of coffee. Maybe you have the review and the retrospective in the morning. That finishes, you have lunch, you have the planning meeting in the afternoon. Again, with some practice, if you know the right way of running these meetings, you can do it all in an afternoon and you can just have a coffee break between a review and a, a um, planning meeting. After all, you're only planning out two weeks of work. You don't need to spend an inordinate amount of time in the planning meeting and you don't have an inordinate amount of work to review when you do the retrospective. That said, I have been with teams who regularly take a whole day to do these things. It might be right for you. Generally, I would expect it all to fit in an afternoon. That is really about as much as there is to um, iterations. Once you've done it, you repeat. It's two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. You don't change the length of an iteration. You don't get to the Monday before the final Wednesday and say, oh, we've not quite done enough work here. We better extend this iteration for two days and finish on Friday. If you do that, you've either shortened the next iteration or you're going to have a ripple effect as all your iterations move and you destroy your rhythm. 
you also, more importantly, if you extend your iterations, you destroy the sense of working to a deadline. If you believe a deadline can always be pushed back, you won't work in the same way. We keep our iterations of a fixed length. Yes, when it's Christmas, you might decide to plan out for double iteration. You know, you might say, you know, Christmas is coming, we've got New Year, very few people in the office, let's just plan a double iteration and have done with it. You might, perhaps as part of your retrospective, decide when you've been doing this for six months that you want to try one-week iterations. You might, when you've done six months of one-week iterations, decide to try four-month iterations. That's fine. You can change your iteration length from time to time, but you do not change it ad hoc on the fly just because you're not going to do this work. The iteration is here to make you better. The iteration is here to force you to get better at the things that you can't do in a two-week period. During the two-week period, everything is happening. Programmers are coding, designing, unit testing. Everything you need to do to cut code is done. Product owners are discovering new requirements. They're explaining requirements and specifications to the development team and to the testers. The testers are automating and testing, yes, should be automated. The mantra on testing is automate, automate, automate. Ideally, I'd like the testers to be automating the tests before the programmers even start writing them. Yeah. Um, not all the tests are going to be automated. There's going to be some exploratory testing. There's always some exploratory testing left somewhere in the system. All these activities are ongoing during the full iteration. That there's there's some overlap and there's you know little handoffs and things, but everyone is fully engaged. At the end of the iteration, it is releasable. Whether you release or not is a business question for your customers. Many people, when we talk about this, say, ah, but our customers don't want it every two weeks. Our customers, once a year is a bit too much for them. That's as maybe. Customers can decide whether they want it or not. The standard the development team is going to hold itself to is that it is releasable at the end of the iteration. When you do this, you force yourself to get better within the iteration. What For teams that are not doing this, for teams that can't do a two weekly release, this is first base. I'm going to be very prescriptive here. If you want to start working Agile and you currently can't get a releasable product every two weeks, your first base, your first goal is a releasable product every second Thursday. You, as a technology team, can then turn to the business and you can say go or no go. It's up to the business whether they want it or not. If the business don't want it, fine. You just do another two weeks and you give them the same option again. And if they don't want you to do another two weeks. Just giving your business customers the option to release or not more regularly will surprise a lot of them. The key message here is iterations alone will make you better. Simply thinking two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, simply thinking metro system will in and of itself make you better. But more importantly, fixing all the things that stop you working effectively in a two-week period, the things that slow you down, the things that prevent the releases, the things that get in the way, the things that you can't parallelize, fixing all of those things so that you can be effective in two weeks will make you far, far better. Iterations ram a rod up your back, force you to stand up straight and force you to improve your posture. Iterations are good. More importantly, iterations make you better. One of the reasons iterations work is because we're working in the small. It is just two weeks worth of work, not six months, not even, a, not even a month, small. Software development does not have economies of scale. We all have internalized the idea that bigger is cheaper. Software development has diseconomies of scale. In software development, we are better working at a small level. Put it this way. 
when you go down to your local supermarket, your local Asda, Walmart, uh, Care4, whatever it is, you expect that buying a large carton of milk will be cheaper than buying the same quantity of milk in three small cartons, right? That's how we've come to think. That's how our giant supermarkets work. It's true for milk, but if you're working with software, it's cheapest in lots of small cartons. If you're doing software, it's cheaper to buy four small cartons of milk. In fact, it's better still to buy one small carton of milk today and one small carton of milk tomorrow and one small carton of milk the day after. Economies of scale do not exist in software development. The other thing is, when you start working in the small, you start delivering lots of small cartons of milk, you reduce the risk. If there's a fault in that big carton of milk, that's a whole carton of milk. What does it say? 32 fluid ounces, four pints of milk written off. If there's a fault in one of those small cartons of milk, that's eight fluid ounces. Small cartons of software reduce the risk as well. Get good at working in the small. For software development, bigger means more expensive and more risk. So work in the small. Keep it small. Get good at working in the small. Take lots of little tiny steps, lots of little tiny steps, and you will be better. It's being small tests, small pieces of code, small stories for development, small tasks for work, small releases, small iterations. Whatever you've got, make it small. Get good at small. One of the things that goes in, in parallel with getting good at small is optimizing your team so your teams can work in the small. If um, you have to set up a new team for each piece of work, of course you're going to feel as though you want to do more big pieces of work. We also need to address teams. One, uh, excuse me, I want to take a drink. Teams need to be effective. This means we need vertical teams. Teams are fully staffed all the time. We want to devolve as much decision making as we can to the teams. And we want to keep teams together. We want to flow the work to the team. The team exists. The team works on project A, project B, project C. The work comes from those different projects, those different products comes into the team. Many organizations have what we call horizontal teams. There's a team of business analysts, there's a user interface, there's business logic, there's a database, there's a test team. And those teams may even be in different physical locations, different floors of the same building. Getting any piece of work done means coordinating the business analysis team and the business logic team and the database team and the user interface team and the test team. And that means lots of handoffs. It might mean lots of documents. It might mean lots of conversations. It certainly makes lots of work for people to manage because these teams need to be coordinated. And there's every chance these teams are doing multiple pieces of work for multiple projects, multiple projects. And these teams have got their own priorities. And when they're confronted with several pieces of work from different places, they've got to, they've got to work out what the priorities are between the, these, these different pieces of work. All too often, priority is decided by uh, decibel management. He who shouts loudest, who shouts most often, get, gets to have their uh, the thing they wanted. We want to get away from horizontal teams. We want vertical teams. Each team contains its own, contains all the functions, all the skills, all the abilities you need to do the work. If it needs an analyst, if it needs UIP, if it needs business logs, people, database, people, test people, they're in there. If it needs some other specialist skills, they're in this team. It might be one person per role. Better still, people are multi-skilled and can multitask. So the guy who does the business logic knows enough about the database and the guy who knows a bit, knows about the analysis, knows a bit about user interface design. I don't know. I don't know what your particular skill sets are, but we want teams which have a complete set of skills, complete functionality. 
That way we have one team responsible for one delivery, one feature, one set of project work, one work set of work on a product. The team is responsible for this. When you've got one of those horizontal teams, it's very difficult when you start to say, why is our project running late, to find out where is the delay because it's scattered amongst these different teams with different priorities. When you've got a vertical team, it's much clearer what's going on. We want vertical teams. All the skills, all the people you need in the team. You have multiple different teams. We're each staffed fully. We also want to put as much empowerment into the teams as possible. You hear people talk about self-organizing teams, self-managing teams, self-governing teams. Uh, the, the, there's various degrees of this and there's different ways you can interpret it and some is more compatible with corporate culture than others. At a very, very basic level, we want to push authority down to the teams. So the people who do the work, the people who understand the problems, are in a position to try and address these problems. You know, if one of the developers says, should this be red or blue? You know, they go to their team lead, the team lead goes to the project manager, the project manager goes to the program manager, you get an answer. But what also happens here is you get delay. You get delay as the message goes up the hierarchy to find the appropriate answer. And then you get delay as the message comes down the hierarchy. You lose a lot of your agility just waiting. Um, it's not uncommon with teams in general. If you analyze the way they work, time isn't lost in coding or testing. Time is just lost in, in delays, waiting for answers, waiting for things to happen. Speed has its own beauty. In the context of teams, we want to devolve decision making to the team so that we can speed up decision making. That's what we want. When the team themselves are empowered have the ability, have the authority, have legitimacy to make the decisions as they need to, they can. Remember, we're only talking in a two-week context here. The team only need authority to make decisions for two weeks. In two, if, if it's a bigger decision, you know, it's, it's going to be outside of that realm, but keep the team moving during that two-week period. Right, we're doing quite well on time here. There's a lot more stuff in Agile we can talk about, we should talk about. When I started planning out these slides, I was absolutely determined to talk about customer involvement. We talk about customer involvement, we talk about requirements and specifications. We should talk more about retrospectives. We should talk more about planning. We should talk about testing. We should talk about stand-up meetings. These are all things, we, you know, instead of giving you five things, I, I could have given you 20 things and they wouldn't fit into the time. Um, I'm sure some of you out there are looking at this list and thinking of other other agile techniques and thinking, yeah, we should have talked about that. Um, the five I've, I've singled out, the five I've talked about are, are the five I think are, are the, the most basic, the most core. Yes, there's other stuff we should talk about. I'm happy to talk about it. I'm not running away from it. It's just, just we have to cut it down somewhere. Um, any one of these five points will make you better in and of themselves. Of that, I have no doubt. Um, and I've almost put them in the order I, I think they're most meaningful. I think you know, if you're a developer and you just start taking action to improve your code and make sure that others can find problems with your code, I think that will go a long way towards improving your quality. You can just do that. I think if the team just starts working in the small, you'll get a lot better. You'll cut out a lot of the cues. If you can start doing iterations, just start every two weeks, review and replan, review and replan. Every two weeks, you'll get better. If you can make your teams vertical, you'll get better. If you do all five of these things, you'll be even better still. And if you can take some of these other things that we've not talked about there, some of these other things that are there in, in the Agile books, in the, in the Agile toolkit, if you can add some more of them to the mix, you'll do better still. Many of these techniques interlock together. Hopefully, you've started already to realize that 
if you're going to work in iterations you need to get the quality up there's no use getting to the last day of the iteration and finding bugs there's no use to getting to the day after the iteration is completed and finding bugs you need to be working with a high level of quality a low level of bugs working in the small locks into a lot of that as well visualizing your work is one way of keeping you honest and keeping you thinking small these things interlock and some of the other techniques that we've not talked about interlock too so hard decision to get it down to five but hopefully you've, you found some use in there there's my five and um, we've got about 20 minutes to take some questions in so I, I, um, there's a window there in the webinar if you've got any questions you can start typing in there um, there's my email address, my contact details. You can always come through the great guys at Developmental as well. Um, I set you up just for this webinar. There's a discount code on that new book. If you buy it from Lean Pub, so it's an ebook, um, you can get it half price with that URL. Uh, I hope that was helpful. Uh, I'm going to take a, a sip of water and then we'll we'll look through the questions um, here. Okay. Um, Okay, let's see. Okay, S some people had problems with the audio in the questions, but you came back. Okay. So the first question there is is Tom Ellis. We have a distributed team. What would you recommend for seeing the work in this instance? Um, there's distributed and there's distributed. Do you mean you've got 20 people sitting in different locations? Or do you have 10 people sitting in one location and two people working from home? Um, I think you, you can still set up, if, you, if you've got a core of a team in one place, um, you know, you've got four or five people in one place, you can still set up a whiteboard, you can still put stuff up on the board, you can still talk it through. If your distributed team comes to the office, they can still see it. In this day and age, we all have cameras in our pockets. You can take a photo, you can circulate it. You can point a webcam at the board. You can um, you can nominate card buddies. You can have, you know, one guy who's working remotely can have a buddy with the team who's on, on in the office and they can talk whenever you need a card to move. Um, just getting started, it's hard to beat using a board. Having said that, obviously when you've got a distributed team, particularly on the remote, in different locations, um, you're going to feel the need to have some kind of central tool you can all look at. The world is full of electronic online tracking tools. Um, I'm not going to recommend any because they are all changing so fast and advancing so fast I can't keep up. I know Jira is perhaps the best known, the best, most widely used perhaps. Um, a lot of people seem to have a love-hate relationship with Jira. Uh, I think the fact that it's so widely used has, has a lot of advantages itself. Um, I worked on a project last year and we used a, to, um, a tool called WebKit, uh, not WebKit, sorry, LeanKit. LeanKit is, is a very visual tool. I really liked it. It, it perhaps lacked some of the features Jira had, but in many ways I think less is, is more so I really liked um, LeanKit um, both of them are, are cloud based solutions if you really need to have something inside your file wall then there's a tool called Target Process which I've also got positive experience with um, you can use TFS if you're a Microsoft shop and there are plugins like Urban Turtle which will enhance um, um, TFS some more if you're in a corporate environment you might find tools like Rally um, some of these tools can be expensive so my advice is go and um, if at all possible start with a physical board and see how that goes when you've got a little bit of experience with a physical board go and look at the tools which are, are free open source or have community editions try using them for a while get some experience of some tools before you go and ask for some money if you do invest in a, an electronic tool, please, please, please also buy a big display and put it on the wall and show your board there. Don't use many features. Don't use the fancy flipping rotating displays. Just display your electronic board as if it was a physical one on a static screen, please. Um, um, I hope that helps, Tom. Uh, I'll, I'll look down the list and see what, who else we've got here. 
Uh, uh, okay, Sunitha. For a project with multiple tiers, complex DB logic, how do we make sure that the proper design is in place when moving from one iteration to another? Will the design at a good level of detail be done before iteration start or is it done as part of the iteration? Um, mm, teams do it in many different ways. Um, for a lot of teams transitioning to Agile, there already exists a requirements document, there already exists a system design and they just just work with it. For many teams who are starting afresh with Agile, they, they are finding the requirements as they're going along and similarly they are working out what the design should be as they go along. For me, a large part of the planning meeting is design in breaking the work down even in estimating the work, we are engaging in an act of design and that's why I think it's important to have the whole team there in the planning meeting. If developers, if architects and others need to have additional design sessions as part of the iteration, then by all means do it. You know, stop and take some time and talk design. For me, the most effective design sessions are just getting the people who it immediately relates to and pulling them to a whiteboard and sketching it out interactively. Um, I'm not a great believer in big requirements documents. Uh, in my experience, big requirements documents are either written before the work starts, in which case they very quickly become out of date, or requirements documents are written after the work is done, um, in which case the design was made up as you go along. Um, the worst case is where design documents are written up front and nobody updates them after the event and people still believe they're valid at a later date. Um, if as part of your planning process for the iteration you need to do some design, fine. If during some of the early iterations you want to spend more time thinking about bigger design issues, fine. Generally, agile teams live uh, a lot more by their tests. Design is something you do, you evolve as you go forward. You take a very minimalistic attitude to design. You do as little design as possible for the tasks that are in hand now. At a later date, when you have some tasks which need you to rethink the way you built something before, you rethink the way you built something before. When you have the automated tests, tests, tests in place, the risks of changing something that has already happened are far less. You can go back, you can rework designs or refactor designs is, is a common term. The fact is software designs that are formulated in detail in advance tend not to survive contact with the actual code. So we tend to just keep our designs lightweight but we keep evolving them. Agile's not about no design and it's not perhaps about less design. The main message should be it's about lots of little regular design. You know, remember why I said get good at working in a small, doing little bits of design. Um, so uh, I hope that's helped, Sunitha. I think I've, I think my answer to my, your question is basically find what works for you, find how it's going to fit in with you. Please don't spend three months doing a design. You know, just just keep it to a few days at most. Do some iterations, then review where you are and just keep repeating. Okay, hope that's good. Um, I'm just at the moment taking taking the questions in, in the order they came in, so I'm not really sure what's coming up here. Uh, Randall Krebs, it seems that a lot of apps for Android and iPad are being developed by one or two developers. Which of the basics are not appropriate for micro teams? Ah, well, uh, let's look over, down to five of them. Invest in quality. Uh, uh, yes, investing in quality is, is applicable. Uh, you know, I've had a few buggy apps on my Android device and I'm not happy with them. Uh, if, you're, if you're, your, your product doesn't survive, you need to invest in quality. Visualising the work. Well, if there's two of you, I still think it's worth visualising the work. Um, let me apply a little exercise here. How many of you are sitting at your desks? I'm sitting at my desk. If I look to my left, I've got my notebook. I'm sure a lot of you use notebooks. 
it's open at a page on my notebook my to-do list and I've got a list of the things I need to do even in small teams I think you will find the people on the small teams often have to-do lists they often have tasks they need to go on a shared board a visual board is a shared to-do list you've got one two three five people putting what they've got to do there even if you've got one person who's working on this thing the chances are he is interacting with other people and if he can show people what he's working on if other people can see it then there's some value there chances are if you've got one person working on it, he's probably got a to-do list somewhere he's already doing this in some form so I think visualization is still valuable of course burn down charts and cumulative flow diagrams are still still applicable um, there's still stuff you can see micro teams um, tend to have their own special dynamics because there are so few people on them there's a lot less impact process changes can make getting good at iterations um, maybe I still think individuals are good at working at iterations you know if you've got one or two people working on something again they're probably still interacting with other people they probably want to give a probably have a demo they could give to the, the larger team their customer representative every so often um, it might even be if you've got just so few people working on it, you might even go for even smaller iterations perhaps one week iterations if you've got a couple of people working on it then you could be pushing out far more regularly so yeah I, I think getting good at iterations applies to micro teams working in a small well you're halfway there already <laughs> you're, you're working in a small you've got a small team that looks kind of good oh uh, I just my my Mac just did a funny trick again oh, there we go hope you got that back um, I think if you've got a small team the small team almost have to work in the small small team have to think about doing small pieces of work. if they try and do large pieces of work they will quickly get drowned so I think for a small team working in a small um, absolutely applicable vertical teams um, well <laughs> uh, short answer is yes uh, if uh, if you've got two developers in your team I hope they've got all the skills they need to do this thing if they are having to call out to other teams to do work then are people on those other teams kind of virtual team members in which case a lot of the points we've just talked about go even more or are those two developers pretty self-contained in which case they are a micro team um, if they are a micro team and they are having to get resources from the database team and the UI team and other people I think my advice would be try think about forming up a larger team you know rather than having two people work on something for six months and interact with a lot of other people could you have four or five people work on something for two months for three months and get a result that much quicker so um, so Randall Randall I think I think yeah I think the five pros basics I've outlined still apply some of the other techniques might not apply um, micro teams are always a bit different but you know yes uh, let's try it okay uh, Igor is your slide presentation available for download? Um, it will be available for download. Um, Div um, Merit Development is going to package up this webinar and make it available so other people can see it afterwards. And as part of that, we'll make the slides available. And I think, Nick, you've got the same question. Yes. Uh, Bavesh, I would like to know when you are going to come out with a business analysis webinar. Um, that's a good idea maybe we should do one <laughs> um, short answer I don't know um, I have done several conference presentations over the last few years on the role of business analysis in agile and it's always a popular conference presentation um, so popular in fact that I actually went and created a, a course of business analysts in agile and um, so I, I think that's a great suggestion I will um, write it down um, and maybe we will schedule that up next I'm sure uh, the folks at development are going to be saying to me tomorrow when do you want to do the next one so maybe Bavesh will we'll get that one scheduled uh, watch this space as they say uh, 
Gulls asked, what is the difference between a horizontal and vertical teams when a vertical team we've got one BA which is engaged for a project 50% of the time and the other 50% of the time distribute to other two projects? I mean the same BA in a vertical team is simultaneously in a horizontal team. Well, oh, oh, yes. Um, so um, it's far from ideal. Um, my rule of thumb is have one uh, business analyst or product owner or product manager in different environments, different requirement setups. The BA role is often filled by product managers or other people. In Agile, we generically call this role a product owner. It's, there's a bit more to it than that, but we'll just leave that for a moment. My rule is you need one of these requirements people for between three and seven developers. If you've got a new product, it's fast moving, the environment is changing a lot, perhaps there's a lot of details, then one requirement specialist can feed three developers. Um, below three developers, below a team of three, you might have the developers doubling up a bit. If you've got a product which is slow moving, it's established, the developers know lots about the domain, the developers talk to a lot of users, a lot of customers, um, then perhaps one business analyst, product owner type person to seven developers. So the f my, my, first com my first answer to, to that question about the business analyst is, is not how's the business analyst on different teams, but have the teams got sufficient requirements expertise? Is half a BA enough for a team or it's possible that if you could have um, one business analyst feeding two small development teams. Suppose you've got three developers on one team, three developers on another team. Suppose they're in the same kind of domains, similar business areas, and perhaps one business analyst is, is feeding both those teams. In which case, perhaps it's not two teams of three sharing one business analyst, but one team of seven. Um, so I'm my first thing is get, let's get the ratio of requirements people to developers about right. The danger is if if you if you go low on this, if the requirements people don't get the time to do their homework on what is being asked for, what is required, what are the details, and most importantly, what is the value, the benefit to the business associated with these requests, and when something is delivered has the expected benefit been realized? If we don't give the requirements person sufficient time to work on those questions, the danger is your developers end up doing lower value work. And the the value you're receiving from the developers is declining because you're, you're asking them to do things which are of low value and you're leaving high value work undone because you don't have time to research it. So I think it's more important to get the ratio of BAs and development teams right. I think in the situation you're describing, there, my guess is uh, the the BA is probably not got the time he needs for any of those three teams, any of those three projects. Um, you're understaffed on the requirement side. My guess is, and you know, just from what you've given me and, and relating to past experience you're probably better off making your next hire a requirements BA type person than a developer because the developer would just cut low value code. Um, you know, that's the simple answer. I'm sure we could talk about this one some more. There's lots of ins and outs there. I hope that helps uh, Gulzak. Um, sorry if I didn't quite get there. Uh, Next one, oh, I'd like to repeat about the, uh, the the slides. Yes, the slides are recorded and we're available. Um, okay, uh, okay, that's the, the supplemental from Gulls. I'm going to skip that and look down and see if we've got any new questions here. What is the ratio of testers to developers? You would like the small team, five to six members. Well, interestingly, I did not say five to six team members. Um, team size is um, for me, a little bit of an exception to the um, small rule. Um, 
in Agile, particularly in the Scrum community, you often hear people say um, a team should be seven people plus or minus two. And um, what often goes unmentioned is of that seven people, what is the composition of that team? What is the right ratio of of um, developers, product owners, testers, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, my personal ratio of developers to testers is the same actually as for business analysts, but for different reasons. Um, on a team which has um, low levels of automation, perhaps a lot of manual testing, then probably one tester to three developers. And I know historically Microsoft and Adobe have even got down to one to one or three testers to one developer. Personally, I've never seen it. Even on the most um, troubled projects, the, the, the highest ratio of testers to developers I've seen is one to three. And frankly, I think if you're feeling the need to have more testers than that, it's a sign of a more serious quality problem. And rather than trying to test quality in retrospectively, you really should be looking and saying, why is our quality so poor? At the other extreme, if you've got a high level of automated testing, if the developers are doing a quality job, I would expect a ratio of one, to se one test to seven developers. A lot of the tests the tester is going to be writing are automatic. Some of the tests might be coming already from the product owner, ready written as automated tests. There's always going to be some exploratory testing. So I would expect some testing to be going on there. Um, in a team of five, six, seven people, you're talking about perhaps one product owner type person, perhaps one tester type person, and then at most five developers. That sounds a very high ratio the developers to others. Personally, I'm prepared to blow the team limit. Um, I'm prepared to go up to a team of about 15, 16 people. Um, I know this breaks my own rule of small, but actually, when you get into the way teams function, and when you get into handling variability, when you get into handling like bugs, when you get hand into the different demands that are made on teams, I think a slightly larger team is better at handling that kind of variability. Some of this discussion is in the Zanpan book and I'm currently working on some more about that. There was some stuff in my blog recently, blog.alankelly.net. Um, I would say be prepared to grow a team to, you know, maybe about 15 people and within that team you may have two people working on the requirements side, you may have two or three testers and you, you may have, you know, uh, seven or eight developers. You know, have a slightly larger team. Um, that would be my advice there. I hope that helps some it. Um, we are kind of on time here. Um, I'll, I'll quickly, uh, as a couple of you have um, have sent supplemental questions. Um, uh, I'm just I'm I'm just trying to cherry pick them. Come on, time. If if any of you really want to go a pressing question, really answer, please please email me at alankelly.net. Um, if if you're happy to have your question and answer posted anonymously in the blog, even better. I've done that with some people before. Um, Oh, <laughs> so the, here's a quick one. I, I, I can't give you the full answer here, but G, um, GP's asked a pertinent question. If a developer completes his part of the iteration two days early, does he start on the next iteration or take a break for two days with the same rhythm? Um, opinion differs on the subject. You will find different advice in different places. Um, my general advice is you put slightly more work into the iteration than you expect to get done. You expectation manage it, and some of that work is work the team put in for their own benefit that they want to improve. You put slightly more work in than you expect to get done, so you wouldn't get this situation where you run out of work. Um, that said, all the work that goes into the iteration is for the whole team, so I'd hope if one, if one developer finishes the work he thought he'd do in two days, he helps out his other team members, he takes on some of the other work. Uh, Yes, uh, yes, uh, HV breaking work down is quite a challenge. It's a learned skill. You aren't going to be able to do it on day one. You're going to spend the rest of your life working with it. Um, uh, Sunith, uh, about the board. 
Um, if you look at my one of my websites, I recently posted a video up there. On I, I spent ten minutes walking through um, how to lay out a board and some questions there. Uh, oh, Jeff Block, that's a great question. Suggestion of caption value. I, I, really, I haven't got time to answer it. Um, maybe if we do that webinar that's suggested on BAs, we can come back to that one. Um, benefit of midweek to midweek. Uh, this gets asked a lot. Um, which day of the week do you have the most public holidays on? Which day of the week are you most likely to take off if you have a long weekend? Mondays and Fridays are more prone to disruption and experience shows that midweek to midweek seems to be more effective. Uh, right, that's the last of the questions. <laughs> Thank you for those of you who hung in there. We got through the questions. Sorry I couldn't answer more of the questions in more detail. Uh, we've used a full hour up. Um, I say please feel free to email me or, or chat to the guys at Developmentor. Uh, I hope that was useful. If you've got any feedback, please send it through. And uh, yes, please buy the books. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll say uh, goodbye and uh, good night.